You are now live, it says. Well, welcome, everybody. <laughs> All right. right. <laughs> well, we are live um, on Great Lakes Shipwrecks Live on the Great Lakes Shipwreck Research Group. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the show. I just want to make sure that we're actually on because uh, there were some changes tonight in the uh, software. So I want to make sure that we're actually on. Um, refresh the page. If you are on watching us, please uh, be sure to uh, comment so we know you're watching us and you can see us. That would be greatly appreciated. Um, yeah, it looks like we're on. All right. For those Good of you know. who tried to tune in last night, our sincere apologies. It seemed that Lake Erie decided to throw one of the storms that sunk many of the ships at us, turned off our power and our internet. So we were without the ability to contact Brendan other than by phone. Well, thank you so much, guys, for agreeing to reschedule so quickly. And uh, thanks again for agreeing to be on the show. It's wonderful to have you. Um, so as you probably know, uh, our guests tonight are Mike and Georgian Wachter. Uh, Mike and Georgian are uh, two of the most uh, prolific shipwreck hunters on Lake Erie and uh, the authors of the uh, legendary Erie Rex series of books. There's Erie Rex, Erie Rex East. But if you didn't get enough in Erie Rex East, there was a second edition, but not to be outdone, of course, there was the West. And <laughs> last but not least, I think I got them all, guys. Eerie I, think you, I think you did, Brendan. You may be the only person who has the entire collection. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm just a terrible fanboy when it comes to books. So anyway, and they're great books, guys. And each one features George Ann's original artwork on the cover. Uh, so... Uh, welcome, Walkers. It's a real privilege to have you on the show. Fun to be here. Mm -hmm. I uh, first met Mike and Georgian at the old Go Ships Festival in Milwaukee, I think. Yeah. I, uh, I, I'm an avid book collector, and I saw their books, and I was like, we got to get these guys, you know? And so uh, <laughs> it was such a thrill to finally meet them in person uh, back before my hair turned gray. And it's, again, a thrill to have them on the show. Um well, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, we're new, doing the show every two weeks now because uh, I am actually out doing field work a lot. I'm out on the lakes. I hope you guys are also out on the lakes. Um, I was out uh, just last week uh, with Bob Jake, Milwaukee, uh, testing out our new, uh, the, the Rex Sniffer Mark I, the new 260 kilohertz Garmin long-range searching sonar that we built our, home, our own towfish for. And uh, it flew like a champ. So uh, we are ready to go out and uh, do some big game hunting. Uh, at the same time, Bob and I took the deep vision little eye and we painted uh, the Milwaukee River and uh, looking for uh, uh, interesting debris on the bottom of the Milwaukee River. And uh, we were not disappointed. The Milwaukee River is just uh, a, a treasure trove of cool stuff. Uh, and if you don't believe me, ask Jerry Geyer. He is the, uh, the local expert. So... Uh, we also uh, scanned the Root River in Racine. We found an overturned car under one of the bridges. Very old, though. It wasn't. I don't think it was anything that people didn't know about. Um, and of course, a big expedition coming up in a few weeks. And uh, hopefully, I'll have some something to report. Um, going out. I'm going out uh, somewhere in Northern Lake Michigan. So that's all I'll say. Thank you to everybody uh, who is uh, who participates in the Great Lakes Shipwreck Research Group. I want to just uh, offer uh, a sincere thanks to everybody who's posted all the cool stuff on the page. Uh, it's really appreciated, and it makes our community really work, because that's really kind of what it is. It's a community of people who are all interested in sort of the same stuff, and we collaborate together and um, makes it a fun place. So thanks, everybody, for that. Um, Tonight, uh, for Mike and George Ann's talk, uh, I would like to invite everybody to uh, ask your questions, post questions for Mike and George Ann throughout the show. Uh, and uh, if uh, if it's uh, you know an interesting question, uh, we may uh, take a swing at it. Um, so, without further ado, um, let's dive on in, guys. So, um, Mike and George Ann, as you as I mentioned, they found I, I think it's forty nine shipwrecks on Lake Erie. That um, is the current number, yes. And, and uh, some of them were found before, but if someone doesn't tell, we found it. <laughs> let's put it this way. You're the ones who interpreted them to the public, and I think that's what's important. There, right? there you go. Some <laughs> of them are originals. Tell the ship's story and do the research to tell its story 
and to interpret it to the public and explain why it's historically important, it might as well not be found. Yeah. So that's, um, that's our theory. The main thing that I, I ask everybody, and it's kind of what our, our audience wants to know about a lot of our guests, you know, who are sort of figures in the uh, Great Lakes Maritime History community is, uh, you know, how, how, what's your background? Tell us a little bit about yourselves and how you got involved in this, frankly, unusual hobby that takes a lot of time and a lot of money. Um, how'd you get bit by the bug, guys? Well, let me uh, show you a couple of pictures. I think I can share that. Yeah, this was taken back in 1972 in Europe when we did a backpacking trip through Europe. We had not yet discovered scuba diving at that time, um, but we wound up in San Remo on the Mediterranean Sea. And hello, go ahead. It's not going to change for me, is it? Let's see if we can go the other way. You could just, I'm actually seeing your um, your PowerPoint deck, the whole deck, not just the slide, not the slide. I'm seeing the whole deck, huh? All right. Let yeah, me... so go ahead and just move to the next slide. It's okay. Uh, let's, let's do that. We'll come. I can do that. I, I can see it. We can all see it, Mike, on the screen. So if you just go right. next... Yeah, if you look at the next slide down. Move it to the next one down, and we'll see the next one down. Oh, just click on it. Cut that out. Why is that not scrolling? We can do this. <laughs> Look yeah. at that work. Um, so we wound up on the shore of San Remo, which is on the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, because we were on the Mediterranean Sea, we decided we would purchase some snorkeling gear. And we did, in fact, purchase that snorkeling gear. Uh, and George Ann found out that she could see underwater. It was yes, amazing. That is George Ann in 1972 mimicking the Little Mermaid. Uh, on the rock. And we grew up next to Lake Erie, but we had never done that before. So if you're going to, should I stop sharing that, I think? Yeah. If, if you're going to dive in Lake Erie, we came home from that trip and George Ann immediately signed us up for scuba diving lessons uh, at the local YMCA, because how else do you get through a winter in Ohio? Um, and you want to tell them what the first thing that happened when you walked into the room was? Yeah, the instru instructor said, he took a look at me, all divers carry their own gear. <laughs> and it was kind of an underwater UDT course at the time uh, where they harassed you and ripped things out of your mouth and the regulator and the mask off and so on um, to order in order to get your certification, so. So it was, um, his actual first question was, what are you doing here? And she said, I came to take scuba diving lessons. He had never had a female in the class before. Wow. Um, for those who may not be aware, I'm gonna brag on my wife a little bit. She did go on to be one of fewer than 200 living women who were in the International Woman Divers Hall of Fame. So I guess she showed him. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> And, and then if you're gonna dive in Lake Erie, which is our backyard, uh, you're either gonna dive mud or you're gonna dive shipwrecks. Um, and for those of us who have dove shipwrecks, if you don't get involved in something other than diving the shipwreck, it just becomes a pile of boards on the bottom. Now, many of you out there I know got involved in photography and we rely on people who take better pictures than us for a lot of our publications and presentations, but we also do photography. But what really hooked us was starting to learn the history of that pile of boards at the bottom. Um, when, when you begin to realize that if you're diving a 100-foot wreck in the eastern end of Lake Erie, for every, and if that wreck is 100 years old, for every foot you go down, you just back, went back a year in history. Um, so learning the stories of the people on board, learning the history of the vessel made them very real uh, and made it so you wanted to go back and dive them again and again and again. And then we started keeping a journal on the boat. And that was because when he couldn't remember anything like the date, whether it was a steamer or a schooner, et cetera. I think it started the day we were going out to, to dive a schooner and I was talking about the boilers. Yeah. And, um, I, and we kept a little book on our boat 
and I have a better head for names and dates and so on than he does. And he would just make up something. So we started this book on our boat. And after a while, someone said, well, you really ought to publish that. Well, of course, that didn't happen right away. It happened like a year and a half several years later. Yes, it took a long time. And then people kept finding new shipwrecks. So we would try and revise it, but not add any more necessarily. Although the first time we did add um, when we reprinted and then we added some on the second one. And then we said, we can't keep doing this because as soon as you add a shipwreck, somebody finds three more. So anyway. So yeah. kind, of, Go ahead. kind of leads into it, you know, um, the books, I mean, uh, they become sort of must haves if you are on Lake Erie and are interested in shipwrecks. Uh, t tell us a little bit about how you guys uh, decided to publish those books. And, um, you know, uh, they, they turned into a, a huge success, obviously. Um, what, was the, what was the path to doing that like? The original book, the first one you held up, that's just titled the Erie Wrecks, um, happened because a very good friend of ours, Jim Pastor, wouldn't write one. Uh, and Jim's one of the most knowledgeable shipwreck researchers I know on Lake Erie and has been a fairly significant influence in, in our development yeah. over time. Um, and before we took that journal we used to keep on the boat and turned it into a book, I asked Jim's permission. He said, well, I'm never going to write it. He didn't actually believe that we would either, but we did. Um, and then after putting that out, we found another two dozen shipwrecks, or we didn't, but they're, they're they were coming to light. They were coming to light. Let's say. Um, so we put out uh, the Erie Rex East, which was actually a rewrite of Erie Rex, but added a whole lot more shipwrecks, a whole lot more depth, a lot more imagery, uh, and became more of a professional publication. And then more and more came to light, so we put out. Uh, the West book, uh, the East book basically covers from Fairport Harbor all the way to the far eastern, I'm oh, sorry. Fairport. The West East. book puts out from Fairport Harbor all the way to Toledo. Toledo. And the East book from Fairport Harbor all the way to Buffalo. Uh, and then we found even more, so we put out a second edition of here, second edition of Harry Rex East. And one of the things you find out when you put out a second edition is everything you have in distribution comes back to you overnight. <laughs> so we swore we would never do it in a second edition. Although when we did, I think you are missing one book. And that's oh, because yeah. we uh, did another publication of Erie Rex West and added about 20 images, corrected anything, added yeah. information that we had that had come to light since uh, the reprint. So. And then uh -oh. I better we're get it. searching for wrecks in the eastern end of Lake Erie, and we come across this lighthouse out in the middle of nowhere. Nowhere, it's known as Gull Island Light. For those of you who are familiar with that area, and that bit me. We went ashore. We looked at the lighthouse. We're going, what on earth is this doing in the middle of nowhere? A little bit of research later, we found out that the Welland Canal used to come out a whole lot further west than it does today. It was not in for Colburn. And the Gala Island Light marked the entrance path to the Welland Canal. Well, that got us more and more interested in the lighthouses that are used around Lake Erie, and that led to Erie Rice and Lights. But my favorite part of that is I said, George, we're going to write a book on lighthouses. And she said, if you want to write a book on stinking lighthouses, you wouldn't write a book on stinking lighthouses. <laughs> I don't think I used the word stinking. I wrote the part, I was busy writing up new shipwrecks. So I said, all right, you do one thing and I'll do the other. And then we have a lot of followers who are saying, when is the next book coming out? And I guess the one upside to COVID-19 is that it did get us to have 75% done on a new book. Um, and Wrecks all over Lake Erie, um, but that have not been mentioned in the previous books because new wrecks are always coming to light. But the other thing that, that drives us is we have a different philosophy from many wreck hunters. 
Um, most of my very good friends who are shipwreck hunters believe the best way to preserve anything they find is to keep it a secret. Therefore, other people really never know about it other than they may know it was found and there are a couple of really, really great people doing presentations on their minds. Dave Trotter comes to mind. Um, but we believe in Lake Erie being such a shallow water, body of water that, first of all, people are going to eventually find them. And secondly, we want to drive diving interest in the Great Lakes. So by documenting the vessel as thoroughly as we can and then publishing that documentation, we, we create a baseline for what the wreck was like the day it was found. Sure. Uh, and then we create an opportunity for people to go out and dive. Um, people will, will get our books or they'll go on our website we have an interactive shipwreck map on our website that gives you all of the information you really need to um, see the to, to go diving on many of these wrecks. So if you take a look at this interactive map, um, you can click on any wreck there or any section in the lake, and it will give you the GPS coordinates for the wreck, give you a picture of the wreck on the surface it will give you the story of its loss um, so we're trying to share it as many ways as we can between the books the website and the um, we have a shipwreck map also yeah. um, that we listed uh, I think we're up to about 340 wrecks because when we redid it we added about 50 to the curve the total but now that is only available online the printed version that was laminated is not around. It's sold out. So. So that would be this map, correct? That would be that. That would be that map. I think we have 305 shipwrecks on that map. Um, for those of you who can't see on the screen, the Small print on the bottom gives you the name of the vessel, its location identifier, and its GPS coordinates. Um, With a couple PAs thrown in there. Yeah, PA meaning position, position approximate. approximate. I mean, um, our boat has not sat on it, nor has somebody we trust well enough to really use the number. Yeah, exactly. But someone's boat has sat on it, and they gave us a number, we just didn't trust the veracity of that number enough to make it something other than the position approximately. Yeah. So, so that's kind of where it came from. Very cool. So that brings me to uh, kind of a, a question for George Ann. Uh, you do the artwork for these books. Um, how how did that come about? These are some really uh, stunning um, representations of these shipwrecks. And I think you're the only person I know that, that does these sort of artistic pictures of shipwrecks. Um, how'd you get interested in that? Well, I started painting, uh, I was a band member, and um, that was my father's idea. I should have been taking art all along. And I started painting, and I seemed to be drawn to pictures that have water in them. And then, well, thinking about illustrating the books, I uh, started painting, sometimes from old photographs, old black and white photographs. They might have been from the 1800s. And I can change them if I care to. Uh, I have some of the pictures I have done, like a couple of the covers of the books are totally made up. Uh, I liked to show the ship sunk and then what was going on. As a matter of fact, uh, my favorite painting is on the cover of the book. And it was from a when we were in Tobermory one time. And we went diving on the Philo Scoville which sits, it ran into, uh, I think it's Bear Island. Uh, I may have that wrong. Um, but the fact of the matter is it sits on white rock slanted down an incline. And we went diving on it during a thunderstorm. And it was surreal underneath there with the lightning suddenly popping out. And um, so I wanted to try and recreate this thunderstorm while we were diving a wreck. It was like diving at night with strobe lights going on. Wow. All around you. All of a sudden you could see the whole wreck 
and then, be black. and then it would be dark, <laughs> dim again. So we yeah. thought we were much safer in the water than on a steel tugboat used as a dive. <laughs> yes. So, and then to illustrate the the ships, I did do some of them. Um, this happens to be uh, my rendition of the Bell Mitchell. Uh, the Bell Mitchell happens to be my favorite wreck. Um, and it is the only wreck that we have not let out for general publication, so to speak, the numbers. Um, the wreck we found, oddly enough, we were in Conneaut, Ohio, which is uh, way east in Ohio. And uh, somebody had told us about a little wreck that they snorkeled off of Ran Raccoon Creek. So uh, we went over there, but somebody else who was a shipwreck hunter had told us about a wreck that was, they were afraid to dive it. It was up by Long Point in Canadian waters and they thought it was a shipwreck covered in nets and they were scared to death to dive it. So they told us where it was. So first we went and found a little beaten up wreck in eh, 15 feet of water off of Raccoon Creek. And then we found um, that we should head north and the wind was out of the south. And the further north we got, the rougher it got. And all of a sudden we ran over uh, yes. this, which we believe is the Bell Mitchell. Wow. Uh, and um, now the best thing is we're already in three to five foot seas and they're building. So we went on to the other site and didn't get back to this wreck for a full year. We had not really sat on top of it and gotten a good number because um, we actually pinned it at cruise doing about 25 miles an hour. <laughs> um, and neither one of us was willing to tell the other we were scared to death. We'd never find it again when we went back. And it's a long way from our harbor to go. It's probably 100 miles or more. Oh, wow. In any case, we uh, continued on. Uh, first of all, we did go dive uh, the site that we had been given and found out that it wasn't a wreck covered in nets. It was a barge dump, and there are two co-ring excavators and a caterpillar loader underwater on a sand bottom with part of the house of a barge, and it took about 10 years to figure out who had lost $100,000 or more worth of equipment in the bottom of the lake. But this is the Belle Mitchell. Um, she is just a beautiful wreck. Um, she lays, as you see her, there are two scuttle butts on the side of her. See those two barrels? They rest on the port gunnel. And yes, she has a brass bell on her. Wow. And it's a beautiful bell. Uh, the wheel is intact. The steering gear is intact. You can see uh, drum style capstan in the center and the bottom, a pump also. And on the um, lower left, uh, right, there is a um, stove, cook stove, cook stove. It's one of two stoves. Uh, we found the base of the compass. There are plates. There were pimsel marks on her. Uh, the top of the cabin is uh, laying on a sand bottom. It's only in 60 feet of water. Um, it's just a gorgeous wreck. So we've been a little reluctant, even though it's in a remote part of the lake, to let this one out. But as I said, it's about the only one we haven't let out, unless of course someone gives us one and says, don't, keep it secret. don't tell, and then we keep it secret. Sure. It looks like a beautiful site, my goodness. It's a nice it is a truly incredible site. The, um, and one of, we've had a few very, very close confidants who have been permitted to dive this thing. Uh, um, and they were impressed too. Mostly because they can take better <laughs> pictures than we do. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, hard in Lake Erie. There are also people that we trust not to give that number out. It's sitting in only 60 feet of water with a brass bell on it that's just a bit too tempting. So yeah. Yep. Keeping that one so, close to the vest. So, Mike, you must have a favorite wreck out there uh, that you've. Uh, I do you've indeed. It. Uh, actually has something of a similar story to it. There are several ways that you find a shipwreck. One of them is that you do the research, narrow the 
area you want to look at and then go out and search um, using site scan sonar. And we have found uh, that's the 49 wrecks that we have either discovered or rediscovered. Uh, the other is that at the end of the day of searching, you go to the bar um, and you get a sandwich and a drink and you're sitting at the bar and strike up a conversation and somebody says, shipwreck searchers, are you? Do you know about this one? And they'll tell you all about a shipwreck you don't know about. So now we have another one for the book. Um, so we were setting up to go and look for a wreck off of Cleveland and we're closing in on our search area. So I brought it down off plane, but we weren't really starting to look yet. And we ran over the image you're looking at right here. Wow. Um, again, just purely fortuitous. So needless to say, we didn't do any more searching that day. We went down to look at this thing and found a lovely tiller steered schooner, eight foot tiller on this thing. Um, the uh, windlass is still in place. You can see on the upper right hand corner, she's got scroll work on her bow. Her starboard anchor is still mounted on the rail. Um, there are dead eyes on both the port and starboard rail. There's a fairly large gash in her from a collision. And we narrowed this down to two possible vessels. Uh, and the first time we did a presentation on it, we named it something other than what we now believe it is. Today, we believe it is the Plymouth. Uh, and we ruled the Plymouth out because another group that uh, works out of the Cleveland area had announced they found a Plymouth the year before. Um, and we consulted with that group, and they were pretty confident they had the Plymouth, so we went with our second choice. And then a year later, that same group came out and did a program on the shipwreck and said, guess what, Walker's got it wrong, it's the Plymouth. <laughs> so, just all kinds of fun involved there. But the most the most beautiful part of this wreck is right there. That tiller, I, I can, cannot imagine steering a vessel this big with a tiller. And, and she was brand new. She was built in 1849, and she sunk in June of 1852. Uh, and interestingly enough, she was in collision with another one of Lake Erie's more famous shipwrecks, the Northern Indiana. The Northern Indiana sent her to the bottom, and the Northern Indiana herself went to the bottom in uh, the summer of 1856. And that was a terrible fire that consumed her. Captain was had left the mate in charge. He was uh, stayed in Buffalo. Uh, that vessel, the Northern Indiana, went back and forth between Toledo and uh, Buffalo for the Michigan Southern Railroad. And uh, she caught fire somewhere in the engine room. Uh, captain, or uh, the acting captain said, you know, stop the vessel. They couldn't, they were, the engineers were driven out of the engine room. And now she is tearing along, uh, fanning the flames. And two other vessels saw her in distress and ran after the Northern Indiana. This is the side wheeler. Um, Panic passengers were throwing pieces of furniture and wood buoys, et cetera, into the water. Uh, in the result, uh, some 29 to 56 people uh, died. And you'll find it's very hard to pinpoint how many people were on these vessels. They didn't keep very good records. And if they did, a uh, conflagration like this would have taken out the books of the purser or the steward that kept track. And very often when they had these horrible disasters, children were not counted or they were counted as half a person. So if a family came on board with four kids, they were counted as two people or babies in arms were not counted at all. So it's real difficult to sort out how many people were on these vessels um, when they went down. But I do love the Northern Indiana. She's actually in Canadian waters in 30 feet uh, of water. And when the current isn't so um, vigorous there, we do have a friend who floated away in his dry suit and had to be rescued um, <laughs> at one point. Yeah, um, the sand covers and uncovers and she has some really, really big machinery. Of course, there is a lot of wood 
uh, lower portion of the hall left also, but she did burn, so that a lot of that is uh, missing. But Lake Erie has probably the greatest number of side wheel steamers of any of the Great Lakes, too. So yeah, I'm a big fan of side wheelers. And I just acquired this woodcut. Oddly enough, you should mention it. I just bought this woodcut of uh, it's from Frank Leslie's Illustrated. Oh, okay. Only. <laughs> do you do you have the woodcut of the Erie? I do. I do have. Uh, there, there's a couple of them, um, but I do. It's uh, there's also a painting which I'd love to get an original or a facsimile of. Okay. Um, I have an electronic version of the same painting. I'll be happy to send you. Thanks, Mike. But, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, if, shoot me a note to remind me I said that because oh, really? the Erie's kind of an interesting story in and of itself because it's another one of the great side wheel disasters. Um, and while it is not known as the greatest loss of life on the Great Lakes. Actually, uh, the greatest loss of life on the Great Lakes is possibly the Lady the the Elgin. Elgin. But the Erie may well have had more people aboard it. Again, the because G of those, I'm sorry, the G.P. Griffith, the G I'm saying Erie. Yeah, the G.P. Griffith may have had uh, more people on board than the um uh, the Lady, Lady Elgin, Elgin. Uh, the loss of life on that vessel was about 300, give wow. or take. Once again, a whole family might not have been counted as a whole family. Interestingly, the, the image you have up right now is the uh, Atlantic. Atlantic. No, it's not the Atlantic. It is. It's the Atlantic Ogdensburg. Yeah. Okay. That's the Atlantic Ogdensburg. Ogdensburg. And I, I, I've had this one for maybe about 10 years. I, I sought yeah. that one out. Yes, that's the Atlantic. Uh, the Atlantic was steaming along in uh, 1852, and another vessel, a propeller called the Ogdensburg, was also approaching, and they were on the north, toward the North Shore. There's a long spit of land opposite Erie, Pennsylvania that sticks out from Canada called Long Point, and they were in deep water off of there and through who knows why, a uh, series of miscommunication. Uh, the Atlantic, at one point, it was thought that they were approaching a slower schooner. In any case, the two vessels collided. There were approximately 500 people on the Atlantic. Once again, these figures, everything is lost when the ship goes down, even if they did count them correctly as they boarded. Uh, a lot of them were Norwegian immigrants. And uh, both vessels collided. They both thought they were not terribly hurt. So they both kept going on their path until the Ogdensburg, the propeller, heard the screams from the frightened passengers on the Atlantic. And she turned around and rescued about 250 people. But that meant that another 250 people were lost in the deep waters off of Long Point. Indeed, the Atlantic is about, uh, the area around it is about 155 foot deep. Um, the ship itself, we've dove it at uh, 140 or, or thereabouts. And the Atlantic actually was a treasure ship. However, the treasure was recovered. <laughs> the treasure was recovered by a diver, hard hat diver named Harrington uh, a couple years after uh, her demise. Of course, there was another diver that reached her first by the name of Johnny Green. And Johnny Green actually um, found the safe, pulled it out on the deck, got the bends. After all, he's diving air in a hundred and some foot of water, and he's diving for hours at a time, and uh, ended up getting the bends. And when he returned to the site, Harrington had found the safe and retrieved it. And there was gold and uh, payroll in that particular um, vessel. But do you want to know about ah, no. the submarine? One of the things used to salvage the Atlantic was an early Loudner Phillips submarine. Um, and that submarine was lost during the salvage operation and is still lying somewhere in the silt off the Atlantic. So Talk there's a submarine still sitting in the Lake Erie undiscovered? There is an undiscovered, well, 
there's some question about that. If we have a side scan image from none other than Gary Kozak, probably the world's foremost side scan imager, that he believes and we agree has the Loudner Phillips submarine. It, it might have. Um, the, wow. The, and, uh, and then talking to some really early divers before the silt had built up, they saw some cylinders uh, nearby and they had, they were trying to raise the Atlantic and they actually had chains under at one point and they thought perhaps the cylinder that they saw was uh, some sort of pontoon for raising, but it may very well have been this sub that was described described as being some 20 to 40 feet long. There are newspaper articles about it. Uh, they set the sub down and it got to 100 feet, not the, all the way down, and it started to leak. So they brought it up and when it was re-submerged uh, with no one in it, fortunately, the hawser broke and it ended up on the bottom uh, next to the Atlantic. Now, this area of the lake is very silty. In fact, if you look at the, the pictures of the Atlantic and what was found, you're looking at a side wheel steamer sitting on the bottom, looking like it could be floating. And if you look at it today, it's three quarters covered in silt. Yeah, it, a lot of it's covered. Yeah. So I, I have this image. Is this related to the Phillips submarine, I assume? Um, that is a Loudner Phillips submarine, but that is in the river up by Chicago. Uh, it was found uh, by the diver that salvaged a lot of bodies off of the Eastland when the oh. Eastland fell over in the Chicago River. <clears throat> and that is a Phillips sub. He had about three of them. And uh, various family members say, they remember out on the farm, there was a cylinder that they played in when they were a child. Uh, at least one of his subs submerged and killed a man and his dog. Uh, but supposedly, Laudner took his family in a submarine and went down to the bottom. It's not necessarily very deep and stayed a little while. But this uh, was found removed from the Chicago River and uh, ex exhibited in around 1950. Uh, 15, when the Eastland um, diver found this on and, the bottom. And one of the fascinating things to me is the news articles about the man and his dog dying in the submarine lamented the loss of the dog, not the man. <laughs> sure. So, you know, our, our history gets rich in a lot of ways. Strange ways. Yes. yes. Truth be told. So guys, um, let me see if I can do this. Uh, here we go. I'm gonna go back a little ways. One of the one of the uh, things that I wanted to talk with you you guys about are um, two two marine historians uh, that are based that were based on Lake Erie, who I followed pretty closely. Oh, you you did too. Uh, and there's Walter a third Taylor. one there. What's that? That's Jim Kennard. That's Jim Kennard with it them. is. It's a much younger Jim Kennard. Um, wow. And for those of you who don't know, Walter and Teddy were. Uh, you know, authors who wrote uh, true for True Treasure magazine uh, back in the 60s and 70s, and some of the first real, um, what would I call it, shipwreck historians on the lakes. And um, what, could you tell me a little bit more about your work with them? I know we both have parts of their collections. First piece was that, you know, Teddy was the actual author. Right. Um, and she wrote under the name Teddy because the magazines at the time simply wouldn't publish a female author. Uh, and the other thing they wouldn't publish was anything about a shipwreck unless the shipwreck involved treasure. Treasure. <laughs> so a lot of the fake treasure stories around all of the Great Lakes, and particularly in Lake Erie, happened because authors like Teddy were trying to get published, make a little bit of money, and the, the mags wouldn't publish them without a treasure story, so they would make one up. And they had files from every lake and they tried to collect everything uh, on every wreck um, from every lake. And we mainly use the Lake Erie stuff. Well, I'm in California on business and I call home like I usually do as a dutiful husband every night. And the first words out of George Ann's mouth were, don't kill me. And I said, oh my Lord, what have you done now? <laughs> said, I spent X thousand dollars buying the files from the Remix. Well, you have to understand, we never met Walter and Teddy, 
but her daughter, after Teddy died, was selling out everything. And they knew divers all around the Great Lakes. And some of these were commercial guys. Um, and they had quite a collection. They would ask people, oh, can I have something from this wreck? Can I have something from the Wisconsin? Can I have something from that wreck? And people would send them stuff for their little museum on the west side of Cleveland. So we have five or six five drawer file cabinets full of their research, uh, which frankly has helped a great deal in, in our work. And then we went over after Georgina bought all the files, and I'm talking to her daughter, and she's selling off the collection, in large part because she hated it. Her parents, she thought, had ignored her when she was growing up because they were so busy with their wreck stuff. <laughs> and so sitting there is a pristine condition Mark V helmet. It wasn't pristine. It was pristine. <laughs> and, and I said, I'll give you $500 for that. And she said, sold. And my wife says, you can't sell them that for It's worth $3,000 at least. <laughs> oh, no. I lost the Mark V helmet um, and waited till she left the room to offer $5 for the ingot off the Pawatic, which we oh, still oh, have today. <laughs> yes. And uh, I wasn't, I was mainly interested in the books and the files. She, they had quite a wonderful collection of books and some old photographs that were really, truly amazing. Some of the old time uh, hard hat divers that had some really great stories to tell of work they had done. Um, but we, I did pick up a few things if I had dove the wreck or if it pertained to Lake Erie. And they had some interesting things. They had guns from police divers. They had uh, just all kinds of little toys from a, a, a freighter that was going to the upper lakes, you know, for Christmas and all kinds of uh, things. And it's so, one of the better collection of shipwreck ephemera that I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it got spread among many, many collectors uh, and is no longer even close to intact. Yeah. Uh, so. I know um, I ended up with copies of most of their magazine articles in the original um on the original like carbon paper okay. so okay yeah. it was there you know she would type them and send the original in and keep the carbon and so i have this stack of carbons of maybe uh, maybe 150 articles that they wrote about different shipwrecks they were very prolific oh very yes yeah i think i got those from al hart if i'm not oh. mistaken it might not okay, have been. okay. So just to, to kind of finish that story, we, uh, this past February, celebrated our 50th anniversary. And wow. I'm very fond of telling the story about the hard hat that she cheated me out of. So for our anniversary, she bought a- A vintage. An ice bucket. <laughs> a vintage ice bucket. A vintage ice bucket that is in the shape of a hard hat. So. <laughs> And, and also a, a lovely piece of bling jewelry that she had custom made with a hard hat and a coin off the Atosha. Oh, wow. So, Very cool. I'd yeah. still rather have the Mark V. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's our, that's our story. I got tired of you talking about it. Well, of course, you know, I, I can't, uh, have somebody from Lake Erie on the show without asking the obvious question. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> when, when, when did you guys find the Marquette and Besmer number two and how come you're not telling anybody about it? We found it five years ago. Um, we actually have a picture of a lantern off of it in one of our books, but we've not finished taking the gold and silver off it. So we're not going to release it until we've removed all the valuables. And we'd have to kill you if we told you where it was. <laughs> <laughs> so shorter answer no we've not found it and to the best of our knowledge neither has anyone else um that's one that even the guys who really keep it a secret if they found it uh it would get out if it was found um there are those who we were talking earlier brendan those who think it's buried completely under the mud of lake erie um 
yeah. none other than Chris Cole thinks it's up on the hard pack. Otherwise, they would have caught it with a uh, fishing net. A fishing net. Mm -hmm. And we don't think it's on the hard pack. We think it's probably in U.S. waters. Otherwise, they would have caught it with a fishing net. Um, and there's a good 75 square mile area of water out there. Maybe 100. <laughs> and maybe 100 in the path that she was last known to be on or a path we can assume she was last known to be on because she was seen or heard in all four corners of the lake within an hour and a half, and that's not possible. <laughs> um, this, uh, this wreck, uh, incidentally, is a car ferry, the Marquette and Bessemer number two. Um, it's the Marquette and Bessemer number two, the first. There was a second one. As a matter of fact, most of the time when you see a picture of the Marquette and Bessemer number two talking about the wreck, it's the wrong boat. It's the replacement boat. And why they named the boat the same, who knows. However, uh, she set off in 1909. It was December. Um, captain and uh, first mate was his brother, uh, Captain McLeod. Uh, she set off from Conneaut on a regular run. She had 30 uh, railroad cars full of coal, three cars of steel castings, and uh, additional structural steel in her belly. In her belly. So she's got to be the largest magnetic anomaly in the lake, and we can't find her. She's 350 foot long and about 55 feet wide. And as far as we know, if someone did find it, maybe a fisherman, uh, nobody's told. So we actually spent part of the last two seasons with Ken Merriman uh, checking magnetic anomalies that he had charted to see whether or not we could find it, but no joy. No joy. So she remains That's right. Thing. Has anybody yeah. ever taken a side scan and just run the course that the boat should have been on? Uh, yes, Mary um, Howard, one of the more prolific people on- Mary and Larry. Mary and Larry have scanned two miles each side of the track. Oh boy. With no success. Well, um, they took my idea. It was, it was a terrible, terrible storm. The Marquette and Bessemer was not the only uh, vessel on Lake Erie to sink that night. So for those who really want to go out and find it, probably the most reliable sighting the night she went down was from a customs officer in Port Stanley who saw her unable to enter the harbor and believed she turned toward Rondo Bay. Uh, that's part of why Chris Cole thinks she's on the hard pack. If she had gone to Rondo Bay, yeah. straight line, she'd be on the hard pack where they don't drag uh, fishnets. Um, but you put that together with a month earlier, she had been in a similar storm, and Captain McLeod had simply put her bow into the waves in order to protect his open stern, because she had no stern gates, from the seas and checked her down and pointed it into the waves and rode it out. Uh, and they almost went down a month earlier, but managed to survive that, that storm. They were going to install those stern gates for the following season. And they were installed on the new boat. So okay. that would have coming out of Port Stanley put her, given the storm and wind directions at night, would have had her headed directly to Cleveland Harbor which is the only harbor she could possibly have gotten in, but he was probably just going to deep water to ride it out. Um, who so knows? Who knows, but our theory is she's somewhere in a line between Port Stanley and Cleveland. That's a lot of water to cover. That's a, That's lot, a lot of water. water. I was going to write her up for the, my Lost Ship of the Month feature on the group, and I um, I dug into it pretty deep. And um, yeah. I, there's just a lot there to cover, and I sort of – abandoned it and, and decided to do a wreck I had already written instead. <laughs> uh, the, the reason I say 75 square miles of water is we have a pretty good handle on what a lot of other people have covered looking for it. Not a real good handle because shipwreck hunters on Lake Erie are pretty secretive. We don't share yeah. what part of the water we've covered. Uh, even we don't do that. <laughs> um, but knowing what I, I know some people have covered, we're probably down to 100 square miles. Okay. So assuming you can do a square mile a day. <laughs> ah, no, that's that's a hard one to find. But there's some other things that I'm sure will turn up that are interesting. I, I actually like I'm, some of the schooners better. 
Same here. Same here. It's just amazing to me that something that big made of metal could well, still be missing out yeah, there. And, and the joy of this lake is we, the Lake Michigan has more shipwrecks than Lake Erie, but we have more per square mile of water than any of the other Great Lakes. That's but right. There, there was a period of time that I thought you could just throw a rock out in the middle of Lake Erie, go diving and be somewhere close to a shipwreck um, <laughs> because we have the highest concentration per square, square mile. And they're all in sport diving depths. The, the lake only gets to be 210 feet deep. Um, and most sport divers are easily good to 130. That gets you to 90% of this lake. It's only 210 off the tip of Long Point. And with simple technical diving, not having to be a real advanced diver, you can make the 210. So, you know, a diver can hit anything in Lake Erie. Sure. And on Lake Michigan, most of our wrecks are under the beach anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, got, we have a few of those that are piled up on a beach, especially at uh, Long Point, which is a big sand spit. Oh, yeah. right. um, and some of them uh, have been proven to be under the mud. Uh, there's one very uh, large, the Lockwood, uh, which right. they feel that a combination of there are earthquakes, um, oh, mini quakes, mini quakes off of Lake County, Ohio, on the other side of Cleveland that borders Cuyahoga, which is Cleveland's county. If you think of this class of wine as the bottom of the lake, and the wine being sand, recognize every time you get a mini quake, it does this. Sure. Or sitting on the bottom, sinks down just a little bit deeper. And this particular sh ship, they knew where it was. It was very, very heavily salvaged, uh, blown up, clamshelled, et cetera. And uh, so they did a number on it. And now you might find a davit. Uh, but we got a really odd hits uh, when we finally found the location. It's because she carried ore. Uh, and then a couple of years later, the guys from Cleveland Underwater Explorers went out with a sub-bottom profiler and demonstrated that the wreck is, in fact, there completely under the sand. Wow. Covered yeah. up. Covered yeah. up under that, sand. That's one of the more interesting pieces of work I've ever seen. And everybody hated it at the shipwreck programs because there wasn't a shipwreck. And I thought, this is fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, one of the things that you know, really fascinates me that I, I'd heard about for years because it's on sort of the, the shipwreck maps and talked about in some of the books on Lake Erie is there have actually been Spanish gold and silver coins found on Lake Erie in significant quantity in one place. I and, um, and, and, you know, it boggles my mind how that could be. And yet it's very, it's authenticated. Can you talk a little bit to that and, and let's speculate a little bit about what, what yeah, on, on, it, on its way to pick up gold in South America, Nuestra Senora de la Tosha came through Lake Erie. <laughs> You're right. Uh, <laughs> now, there is a there's an area up off of Erie called the Coin uh, Pile. Buffalo. Buffalo. Um, that divers have been going to for years. I mean, they were diving the Corn Pile before we started diving in, in the early 70s. Uh, and bringing up coin off of it. And there is specie of all type. There are Spanish coin, there's gold, there's silver. Um, there are coins from around the world in this coin pile. And it's probably was a payroll. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, the History of Dive Museum uh, down in Isla Morada, Florida, where we happen to be associated with them, uh, they have a bunch of coin from that coin pile. And we also have known a couple divers that um, um, have worked the coin pile. The one time we went up there, uh, we got blown up. So Yeah, we were in a 12-foot boat, and the boat seas were running only five to six. Yeah, oh, so we, didn't, we never <laughs> dove it. So but. we have never dove it, but we have a number of friends who have dove it and have coin out of it. And, I'm and, not sure they're getting so much these days, but at that point, someone had found it, and uh, they were, and the old clay pipes and all kinds of debris, uh, right up there by Buffalo. So we we've, we've never really done the research to find out what it may be off of, mm -hmm. um, but there are a number of shipwrecks in that area that undoubtedly are its primary source. So it's interesting because there, there, there was a lot of uh, foreign, you know, currency like that used early 
on. Oh, yeah. Well, it, it was very common exchange. Uh, we didn't really have a currency to speak of back in the early days. Yeah, it could uh, be early 1800s even. Yeah. Or even earlier, uh, the Bradstreet expedition uh, was in 1764, right after the French and Indian War and before we were even a nation. And when you realize that a lot of the loss of life on these old side wheel steamers and the schooners with, when we were transporting immigrants was because the immigrants had gold sewn in their, their petticoats for the women or in their vests for the men. It was, the, it was their life savings that they were going to start a new life in the new world. It would be um, interesting to me to see if these are if the coin piles could be archaeologically examined because you know the clay pipes, the things of that suggest a certain time period, and the coin could easily yield a time period and a likely source um, for a, a vessel. Um, they know, could indeed. They could. There were se there were several expeditions, uh, the Wilkins expedition and the Bradstreet exp expedition. Uh, that lost a considerable number of ships uh, as they were doing a show of force against Pontiac and the Warring Indians at the close of the French and Indian War on Lake Erie. And these were smaller vessels, maybe 40 mm -hmm. foot long bateaus that the soldiers would row, or they might have a small sail that they would fit to uh, the ship. And they are, um, there is a cannon that was found uh, off of Avon Point. We live near Avon Point. Sure. Uh, a small field piece. And um, we discovered in one area of the lake, um, we were led there by an underwater archaeologist uh, who was sort of an amateur guy. And uh, uh, lo and behold, I came up with a bayonet wow. uh, that Mike said, that's the windshield wiper off a of Volkswagen. And I said, I don't know what it is, but it looks. <laughs> uh, and, um, and there were cannonballs there. There's a rammer. Uh, there was a trigger guard. And what happened was when they lost half the ships in the Bradstreet expedition, uh, they buried a lot of the munitions uh, because now they had not enough boats for all the soldiers. So about 380 men had to, uh, walk back to Fort Niagara. And interestingly enough, they buried six six-pounder cannons, supposedly went back the next year to retrieve them and didn't get them. So to the best of our knowledge, those six cannons are still out there somewhere. Wow. One cannon recovered in Lake Erie. Um, it was on display for a long time in the Buckeye Divers Dive Shop because uh, Paul uh, Reynolds found it. And he found it the way many things are found. They had been diving for the day. They were finished diving, had anchored the boat, and jumped in the water to swim off the beach and tripped over the cannon. Wow. How would you like to <laughs> trip over a cannon? <laughs> that and the bell from the G.P. Griffith are probably the two best things so to for, have come out of the lake. For anybody in the audience that really is interested in finding shipwrecks, we have found far more success by accident and in bars than we have in the hours and hours and hours of absolutely boring side scan sonar searching that we have done. I think everyone can attest to I that. Think that. Is hours of sheer tedium interspersed with moments of ecstasy. Yeah. More shipwrecks are found in bars with commercial fishermen, I suppose, that are found with side scan. Uh, well, that's, uh, that's how they found the Wexford. Roy Pickering um, and, and Alan King, who are among the most prolific finders of shipwrecks on the Canadian side of Lake Erie, have found most of them because the fishermen call them when they snag a net. They go out and loosen their net and have a new shipwreck. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to find a shipwreck. It's a great way to find a shipwreck. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So guys, um, what's it, what's, what's the future hold for you? Uh, you guys still out looking, uh, new books coming out. I, I, I hear, uh, we do have one in the course. works that, that we're probably going to finish up. Um, we've slowed down a great deal as our hair turned gray. Um, speak for yourself. We still spend Mine didn't turn gray. part of every week, uh, you know, running side scan back and forth across the lake. Um, unlike many of the people in your audience, we don't use a towfish. Our lake is so shallow, we can use a hummingbird uh, unit. So it's a hull-mounted unit. 
Because sure. most of the time I'm searching only in 60 to 80 feet of water. Um, so we get a good clean picture even when there's a th strong thermocline with that mm -hmm. whole unit. Yeah. And, and that we also means that when I'm at cruise, she can still spot a shipwreck when we go by. Because okay. she's staring at that screen all the time. If she sees a straight line, I have to stop. <laughs> I get I get what is called go backs. Certain number, and then he gets tired of them. Oh, that's a rock pile. Oh, that's not a rock pile. But we have found a couple uh, shipwrecks while we were at uh, the, cruise. The two we shared is our favorite wrecks were found while we were at cruise. While we were at cruise. We weren't specifically so, looking for them. And to, to quote a very dear friend of mine, Mr. Trotter, uh, finding shipwrecks is a function of time on the water. Um, we the spend more time, a lot. time you spend on the water, the more likely you are to find a shipwreck. Yes. Very true, uh, guys. Yep. Well, we're up on the hour. And uh, I want to uh, thank you guys uh, for being on the show. Uh, hey, thank you for having us. We had a lot you. of fun. And uh, great to hear you guys tell these stories about some of the wrecks that you found over on, on Lake Erie. And uh, there's a lot of stuff that I'm sure our listeners have not heard about before that you guys talked about tonight, you know, particularly the coin piles and uh, just, just cool stuff. So thanks so much for okay. uh, being on the Absolutely, show. Absolutely, Brandon. All right. Uh, you take of, very good care, sir. Yeah. Good yeah. hunting. A couple of, couple of housekeeping things before we wrap up. Uh, we're not going to do a Zoom room tonight uh, just because um, – we uh, are off our usual night, and um, uh, we will do one uh, next in, in two weeks. Uh, our guest for two weeks is still TBA. I have uh, several people lined up, but I'm still jostling the dates around. A lot of people are on the lake right now, so uh, I will uh, announce uh, within the week who the uh, next presenter is or the next, next guest is going to be on the show. Um, and uh, I think that's about it. So uh, in two weeks, on Wednesday night, again, uh, feel free to join us, and uh, this show will be uploaded to YouTube uh, tonight. So if you want to watch it or you want to share it on other channels, feel free to do so. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and thank you so much, Mike and George Ann. Uh, Mike and George Ann, stick around after we close out, and uh, have a good evening, everybody. Okay. Okay.